Hello, my name is Aaron Calderon, and I'm one of the organizers for the special session on type motor space and GNS occurrence. And I'm going to be giving you a little crash course introduction to type motor theory today. All right, so let's begin. So first off, I want to talk about moduli spaces. And the first question we have to ask ourselves, and the first question we have to answer is, well, what is a moduli space? Um, lots of people have different answers for this, uh, different specific answers. Um, but in big picture terms, a moduli space, what it is, is just a space which parameterizes objects. I'll give you a couple of examples of these in a second. Um, but what you want to think about is it's some sort of parameter space. So let's start with an example. Uh, so let's take a triangle living in the plane here, and we'll label it sides x, y, and z. All right. And so, of course, you know, from a triangle, you get a tuple x, y, z, the side lengths. But of course, we can reconstruct a triangle from its side lengths as well. Right, so if we have a set, a tuple, x, y, and z, so that, well, the triangle inequality holds and it's not degenerate, for each one of these triples, so x plus y is less than z, y plus z is less than x, and z plus x is less than y, right, from this information, from one of these tuples, you can rebuild a triangle. Uh, so this gives you the moduli space of all triangles up to uh, congruence, of course. We can also look at a slightly higher level example. So if we take, say, RPN, we can remember that, well, this is the space of lines, right? So this is the mod of all lines inside of Rn plus 1 the moduli space of real lines in Rn plus 1. We could also take CPN, the moduli space of complex lines in Cn plus 1. Or, of course, we could also look at the Grassmannian Kn, which is the moduli space of k planes Um, in, I'll say, f to the n, where, you know, f is a field here. Now. And so what is Teichmiller theory now? Um, sort of the tagline is just that, well, Teichmiller theory is the study of moduli spaces of geometric structures. on surfaces. So before we get further into the math, the first thing we need to address is the namesake of the field. Oswald Teichmiller was a brilliant mathematician and also a very bad person. He was an avid Nazi. He organized a boycott of Landau, who was Jewish, while in university, and enlisted to serve in the German army. Many of his seminal papers were actually written while he was on the front, and he ended up dying in the war. It's reasonable to ask, then, why things are named after him. And mathematically, at least, it's because he really was the first to start studying the specific moduli space we'll be talking about later on in detail. While we won't be talking about his specific results today, he introduced a lot of the fundamental ideas, uh, many of which are still big theorems today, and he worked out the foundations of the analytic theory of quasi-conformal maps between surfaces. That said, there are still many folks who are, do not want to name things after him due to his abhorrent non-mathematical actions. This is a tough and important conversation to have, um, and we need to keep on having it, and I don't think it'll be settled anytime soon. Uh, a little more history, just so you know. The modern interest in the subject is really due not to Teichmiller, but to the work of Lars Alfers and especially Lippmann Bears in the 50s and 60s. For this reason, some people actually call it the Bears Teichmiller space instead of just Teichmiller space. Uh, citing Plutarch, Bears actually famously said of Teichmiller, does not nece of necessity follow that if the work delights you with its grace, the one who wrought it is worthy of your esteem. So there was also a renaissance in the theory uh, in the 70s and 80s, thanks to Bill Thurston's work on surface homeomorphisms, so compactification of Teichmiller space, 
his exposition of the relationship between it and three manifolds and so much more. I might actually hazard a guess that most of what you'll see in the talks goes more to Bears and to Thurston than it does to Teichmuller. With that said, let's now start talking about moduli spaces of surfaces. So first off, let's start with the basic example, um, the torus, right? So the torus, surface of genus one, we know that we can also think about it as a square in the plane with sides glued by translation. And here I'm going to think about this actually as a square, so I want to actually think about this as R2 mod Z2, if you want, um, both additive groups. And by the magic of the uniformization theorem, um, a complex structure on the torus, by which I mean just a, a, a set of charts whose transition maps are complex by holomorphisms, uh, complex structure on the torus, is actually the same thing by uniformization as a flat metric on the torus or a locally Euclidean metric um, up to rescaling. So that means if I want to think about a complex structure on the torus, all I have to do is think about a flat metric. And so we're really just going to talk about flat metrics. And so every torus, this means, is representable as uh, a parallelogram with opposite side screw gluten. Mod gluing. So we've seen already that sort of this nice rounded torus gives a, um, comes from a square. But if I were to take, for example, a really long and skinny torus, right? Maybe I could get this by gluing together a really long and skinny parallelogram um, with opposite sides glued. And maybe let's go ahead and give names to these opposite sides. Let's call this sigma and this tau. All right. And so up to rescaling and rotation, um, we can always assume that sigma is equal to one um, up to rescaling and rotation. And what that means is that the space of all parallelograms that we can glue to get tori um, is equal to, well, the space of possible ways to complete the vector one into a, a positively oriented basis of R2. So that's just the upper half plane, H2 which is the set of you know, x, y, such that y is positive. So let's draw a picture of this. So uh, here I have my upper half plane, and here's my vector 1. And if I have any other vector, say here, tau, inside of it, well, you know, I can complete this to make it into a parallelogram as such. Or if I have another vector here, tau prime, I can also complete this into a parallelogram. And to get so get a different shape. So that means you know my space of parallelograms is H2. And so you might think, you know, well, I said that every parallelogram can be uh, or every flat torus can be obtained by gluing a parallelogram. So that means that the space of flat tori um, is H2. Um, but that's not unfortunately quite right. And why isn't this right? Well, because two parallelograms can give the same torus. So let's, let's see an example of this. So we've already seen, right, that the nice square torus gives us this nice, uh, you know, reasonably rounded uh, torus. So this is the torus with vectors 1, 0, and 0, 1. But now what happens if we take the torus um, defined by gluing the parallelogram 1, 0, and 1, 1? All right. Well, what we can do, well, so we glue it up and we get a torus. Sure. Um, but what we can do is we can cut this and then repaste it. So now that we see that these two sides are identified, and so I'm just going to take this, I'm going to glue it over there, and we see that, in fact, this is the same uh, 
the same square torus. So by cutting and pasting, you can turn this parallelogram back into a square. And so in fact, we get the exact same torus, um, even though we have different parallelograms. And so the, the point is that the representation of my torus as a parallelogram This corresponds to a choice of generators of pi one. Right. So if I take the sides, so if I, here I'm going to take the two square, two sides of the square. Maybe I'll use red. So here's this side. So give me this curve when I glue it up. And then I take the you know this upside. This will give me that curve when I glue it up. But now if I take the two sides of the slanted one, right, it looks like this and this. This diagonal curve is the same as this diagonal curve, which is the same as this curve, which is different than the orange curve that just goes up and down. And so we see that the two parallelograms are actually, they're the same torus, but they're tori, the same torus equipped with different choices of generators for pi one. And this choice of generators is sometimes called a marking. And so we see that the space that H2, the space of parallelograms, is not the space of flat tori, but rather, um, if we, in order to fix this, we can say that this is the same as the space of marked flat tori, where a marking here is just a choice of generators for our fundamental group. The space of marked flat tori is the Teichmuller space of the torus. All right, but now you might be saying, OK, Aaron, that's the space of marked flat tori, but what if I just want the space of flat tori, right? I don't want to have to remember this extra data. Well, we know that right, H2 is the space of marked flat tori. And this, so that means that in order to get the space of flat tori, we should just mod out by the thing that uh, interchanges markings. So interchanges of markings, which in fact is the exact same thing uh, as the mapping class group, which I believe Didac is going to define in his talk. So this is the mapping class group of the torus. All right, and so uh, it's a fun exercise to show that well, two uh, vectors, A, C, and B, D, um, this uh, additive subgroup inside of R2 is the standard integer lattice. So I'll just write is Z2, um, you know, here generated by 1, 0, and 0, 1. You know, if and only if uh, this matrix A, B, C, D is in S, L, 2, Z. Right, and so equivalently, what this is saying, this is saying that the torus whose edges are AC and BD, this flat torus is the same as your standard square torus, one, zero, zero, one, um, if and only if ABCD is an SL2Z. Okay, and so now what this means is that uh, the flat tor space of flat tori, it's H2 mod the space of change of mod the group of change of markings. And so that means that the sp moduli space of all flat tori is actually just equal to H2 mod SL2Z, where this acts on H2 mm -hmm. by linear fractional transformations. So I think I'll just show you a picture now. And so here is H2, um, and I've drawn for you and shaded. This is a fundamental domain of the SL2Z action. And when you glue it up, so you take this side, glue it to here, and these two sides, and so you have to sort of glue them together. So you're taking this triangle and folding it in half. Um, you get this sort of pillowcase triangle that ends up having two cone points of order pi and two pi over three. And this, so here we had H2, which was the moduli space of marked tori, or the type motor space of tori. Uh, and here we have the moduli space of flat tori. 
So H2 is the space of marked flat tori, aka the Titanmore space. All right, so that was genus one. Uh, the genus one case is a little more classical. You know, we sort of know almost everything we can about the genus one case. I'm sure someone in the comments will you know, prove me wrong about that. Um, but um, what I want to do now is move on to the higher genus case where things get more interesting and more mysterious. So when you have a closed surface of genus greater than or equal to two, at least, um, then the uniformization theorem, again, this magic wand, which it says that we can, again, replace the space of complex structures, complex structures on SG, so here's SG, um, with now not flat structures, because we've got a surface of higher genus, but now by hyperbolic metrics. Um, on your surface of genus G. And so, well, first off, what's a hyperbolic metric? So a flat metric is something which is locally isometric to the Euclidean plane, whereas a hyperbolic metric is something which is locally isometric to the hyperbolic plane. Okay, and so maybe that's, you know, that sort of intrinsic definition isn't the most helpful, so let's think of an example. Okay, so from your algebraic topology one class, um, you probably saw that uh, genus two surface, right? You can represent this as a octagon with sides glued. And so if I'm going to be careful, right, this side should be glued to this side. Um, this side should be to, glued to this side. That should give one handle. And if I glue this side to this side and this side to this side, that should give me the other hand. OK, and so this is just a completely topological statement. But now, what happens if I actually take the hyperbolic plane? This is my hyperbolic plane here. I'm going to use the Poincare disk model. And inside of it, I'm going to actually find a hyperbolic octagon now. And just as we sort of glued um, the glued a torus out of a flat parallelogram, I'm not going to glue my genus two surface out of a hyperbolic octagon. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a hyperbolic octagon, which is regular, so it has a rotational symmetry, um, though my picture might not seem it. Um, and the angles uh, at each vertex, I, I want it to be 2 pi over 8, so pi over 4. And now I'm going to glue it uh, according to the same pattern that I specified. And so what happens when I do this, when I glue this up, is, well, I get a genus 2 surface, right? Algebraic topology tells me that. And away from the vertex, we have like a little disk here. We have a little disk here. So we actually have a hyperbolic metric. Um, and around the vertex, well, we have a total angle of 2 pi, but there are eight of these. So we have an angle of 2 pi over 8 times 8. And so that gives us a 2 pi angle. And so that means that all the little sectors here around the vert vertex, they all piece together to give an actual hyperbolic neighborhood of my point. And so I get around every point, I have a neighborhood which is actually locally isometric to the hyperbolic plane. And so this is what I mean when I say a hyperbolic structure on the surface of genus uh, two in this case. All right. And so now that we've seen this example of a hyperbolic structure, obtained by gluing together a hyperbolic acron, it's not too hard to see that if we take this set of ways of representing a surface genus 2 as an acron with sides glued and total angle 2 pi at your cone point, well, this will give us a space of hyperbolic structures. Hyperbolic structures on S2, on a surface of genus 2. Um, but again, Right, just as for a uh, torus, if we you know, represented it as a parallelogram glued, we sort of naturally had associated a choice of generating set for pi one. Um, if we represent a surface of genus two in this way, this is we also get a generating set for pi one. So this is in fact 
right? Not just the set of hyperbolic structures, but this is the set of marked hyperbolic structures. And what do I mean by this, right? This is this set of marked hyperbolic structures is, well, it's the set of hyperbolic structures plus a choice of generating set. for pi one. And it's a choice of generating set that sort of cuts the surface up into this octagon. This set of hyperbolic structures and choice of generating set can also be encoded as the set of hyperbolic structures, or maybe I'll say the set of hyperbolic surfaces x, plus um, a, homeomor a homeomorphism uh, between sort of the topological surface of genus G and x. So this now is sort of your, if you want, a for, your formal definition of what a marking is. It is a homotopy class of map between a topological surface and an actual geometric representative. Right? And so this is the space of marked hyperbolic surfaces, um, which is exactly the type Miller space of my surface of genus two. And that's your definition of type Miller space. It's the space of marked hyperbolic structures, equivalently the space of marked complex structures. All right. And now if we want to get rid of the marking data and we want to look at the moduli space, M2, which is the moduli space of genus two, um, you know, which is the same thing as the space of all hyperbolic structures on S2 up to isomorphism, then, well, the way that we get this is that we take the space of all marked hyperbolic structures, aka the Teichmuller space, and we quotient out by the change of marking. Um, and again, just as in genus one, uh, this change of marking group is also known as the mapping class group. All right, so just to put it on uh, another, you know, another slide, just to emphasize again, MG, here this is the moduli space, so the space of all hyperbolic structures. This is the same thing as the type Miller space of your surface of genus G, the space of all marked hyperbolic structures, mod the mapping class group. And in fact, um, this, this quotient um, demonstrates the type Miller space is the orbifold universal cover of moduli space. All right, and now to conclude, I'd like to end with a theorem that will help you, hopefully help you understand why we like to think about Teichmuller space and not just moduli space too. Now, this theorem is actually originally due to Teichmuller, um, though the proof I'm gonna show you as do really, I guess, to Fenchel and Nielsen. Um, and this theorem is that, well, Teichmuller space is contractible. And to prove the theorem, I'm actually going to throw to myself an NCNGT uh, two years ago. Take it away, Aaron. Now the question arises, how do you actually describe a hyperbolic structure? Equivalently, how do you give coordinates to a point in Teichmuller space? One answer comes by way of what are called fenchel nielsen coordinates. Fix a pansy composition P. This is a set of simple closed curves on your surface which cut your surface into three hold spheres, which in turn look like pairs of pants. Cutting along P, you're left with a collection of 2G minus 2 pants, and we can describe our original hyperbolic structure by the geometry of these pants together with some sort of gluing information. Now, it's a standard exercise in hyperbolic geometry to show that the cuff lengths uniquely determine the hyperbolic metric on each pair of pants just cut it into right angled hexagons. Um, so we can exactly specify the shape of these pants by specifying 3g-3 positive parameters. 
Now, there are 6 g minus 6 boundaries to the bands, but boundaries that are glued together have to have the same length. There's a whole family, though, of ways to put these pants back together, coming from different choices of twisting or shearing along each curve. To remember the shearing, we choose some point on each pants cuff. It doesn't really matter which, but there's some geometrically nice choices. And then we measure the twist along each curve between the chosen points. Therefore, we can specify shearing by exactly 3g minus 30 arbitrary real parameters. With this, it's not too hard to see that we've now completely described our hyperbolic metric, that is, coordinatized type noise space, by 6g minus 6 parameters. One often sees functional Nielsen parameters described as a product, but the identification of zero twist was kind of arbitrary, depending on how we chose our original base point. So it's more accurate to say that functional Nielsen coordinates parameterize type noise space as an affine bundle with fibers of dimension 3g minus 3, the shearing information, over an orthant, uh, r greater than 0 to the 3g minus 3, which uh, tells you the shape of the pairs of pants. So those are Fenchel Nielsen coordinates. You get one coordinate system for each pants in composition. All right, well, thanks, Pastor Aaron, and thank you for listening. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the rest of the session.